mi az európai választások tétje az európai zöldek szempontjából, mik azok a témák, amik a legfontosabbak az európai zöldek számára, és mik azok a változások, amiket el akarunk érni a következő négy évben az Európa Parlamentben, illetve az Európai Unióban. At the European election, one of the things that are at stake is whether we will get um, Greens into the European Parliament from Hungary as well. And uh, we have uh, the top candidates here, and uh, it's looking very good. So that is one of the issues that are um, at stake, whether you too will uh, enter the European Parliament, and I very much hope so that you will do, because we can use every reinforcement possible in the European Parliament. The Greens and the European Parliament are a, a sizable group. We have approximately 7% of the European Parliament. And we have actually managed to achieve quite a few things in the last legislative term, the last five years. We have, for example, um, stopped a trade deal that was supposedly only on... Um, preventing fake Gucci bags, but actually was much more on freedom of the internet and access to medicines in developing countries. So we managed to stop that as a fairly small party with the support of the civil society. That was a big achievement. We have managed to reform the fishery policy, which I, okay, maybe not here, but in general it's a very big issue. <laughs> And we have managed to make it more sustainable and fairer to both fishermen and fisherwomen as well as to people in other countries and to fish, of course, as well as being great. We have managed to introduce important changes and incentives, for instance, on energy efficiency, where we pushed through a directive. We have also managed to push through a regulation on data protection, which is a very important issue. And even in very uh, difficult areas like migration, where we usually have a strong majority against us, we have managed to put some important human rights safeguards into the law so that migrants can actually benefit or have now more rights than they have before, even though, of course, we're by far not um, satisfied by those changes. So you can see that Greens really make a difference in the European Parliament, and I think that's especially important now, since we're facing maybe the most decisive European elections that we ever had. Now from 22nd to 25th of May, in some countries, um, like people vote on different days. Um, and um, what is at stake is, in general, the question like, how do we get out of this economic crisis? Because we're still very much in the middle of a deep economic crisis, which is also a social crisis. In the European Union, we now have 26 million people being unemployed. That's basically a 29th member state. It's a huge amount of people who are living without a future perspective. And of those 26, 26 million, um, 5.5 million are young people under 25. And especially for young people, unemployment means a big problem because... Um, when you earn little in the beginning of your work life and work career, you will earn less during the rest of your life as well. And in countries like Spain, you have a youth unemployment rate of up to 60%, which means that really a whole generation is, is left without a perspective, without hope for their future. And that is creating big problems for the individuals, but also for the society in terms of economy, but also in terms of democracy, because if you have a whole generation like that feels let down, then um, this creates really important problems for the whole of society. So this is the question that we have to decide at the European elections. And um, there is parties who say, well, we just have to make more austerity and we have to make more budget cuts, and then we're going to come out of the crisis, which is something that we Greens very much object to, because we have seen this, that the austerity measures have been deepening the economic crisis, but also deepening the social crisis and the gap between rich people and poor people, and austerity hasn't created any jobs so far. 
So what we propose instead is that we invest into the sectors and the areas where we can create good quality jobs, jobs that are sustainable and are still going to be with us in 20, 30, 50 years. So jobs that can really give a perspective to people, but also to the economy and to member states. And we strongly believe that jo those jobs can be found in the sectors of renewable energy, but also energy efficiency, but also education and healthcare. And all those areas would be really beneficial to the society. The whole society would profit from having a better education system, from having an economy that is self-sufficient in um, energy terms, but is also like doesn't use fossil fuels anymore. So you would really have a win-win-win situation for everybody involved. But it, of course, needs some investments. Yeah, you can't just sit around and wait that something is happening. You have to do something. So what we, for instance, proposed was that the European um, Union puts incentive or invests into research and development in the re renewable sector and in the energy efficiency sector, because there really a lot of jobs can be created. Um, but unfortunately, conservatives and social democrats have voted for budget cuts in precisely those areas. So those areas where we could have created many jobs, um, those were left alone and conservatives and uh, social democrats rather decided to put more money in border control and closing off European borders rather than in creating new jobs. So this is, well, that's a, a decision that you can take on, on 25th of May, which of the two ways um, would be more beneficial for the European Union. We're also going to decide in, like, about the question like, what sort of Europe do we want? And of course, that's a very broad question and you might have different ways of answering. But for me, really the next step of the European project, that is to develop a social Europe. A Europe that takes care of the social rights of people and also the, the needs of people. Because I think also a big part of the Euroscepticism is, is not so much that people say we don't want Europe, but that people want Europe to take care of different things and that they want Europe to protect their pension rights, for instance, to do something about the income level, those issues, or about education. And um, I think it's important that if we want to move to a European Union of its citizens, of the people who are living in this European Union, that we at the European Union level care more about the social rights and the social needs of people. So for me, this is really um, the big next step forward in the European project. Um, on 25th of May, we are also going to decide whether we want to have a more democratic Europe or not. So far, a lot of the crisis mechanisms when it came to the, to, to the rescue um, measures for the euro, those were always decided by member states in some secret rooms where nobody really knew what was decided, who was in favor of what, and who opposed what. And we need to bring those decisions back into the public sphere, back into the parliaments where decisions and lawmaking belongs to. And that is something that we advocate. But we also want that citizens have a greater say, all those people who are living in the European Union. And uh, therefore we need to develop further the elements of direct democracy that we already have, but we also need to find new ones so that really people have a, not just a feeling, but also an understanding that their voice matters and that what they think really has an impact. That is something that we want to promote. And of course, and not lastly, the European elections will also decide whether we will have more of the fortress Europe that we currently see or a more open Europe. The European Union is investing millions and millions of euro each year to close off our borders like even further. We have this border agency Frontex, which has a yearly budget of um, approximately 80 million euros compared to an asylum support office, so to say the good guys from our perspective, that get like more or less 12 million euros per year. So there's a big, big difference, a huge gap between those two. And more and more investments are being made in order to keep migrants away. We have satellites being deployed for finding smaller refugee boats. The Commission even wants to employ drones in order to stop migrants. And the next big thing is already coming, that is a um, check of biometric data at, data at the outside border, at the border control points, where um, not only migrants will be affected, but everybody who's crossing the border. And we need to stop this, this rage of securitization, this 
this closing of the borders, because we shouldn't forget asylum, that's a European invention. That's an invention that we made because of the experience of war and persecution after the Second World War or in the Second World War. And what we have learned from it is that everybody should find protection when needed. And this is something that we have to keep in mind. And when we look at the Syrian crisis, where um, more than three million, three, more than three and a half million, one should say, of Syrian people are um, fleeing and are outside Syria. And of those, one million is in Lebanon, which is a small country and only has four million inhabitants and is poor and has a hell of a lot of other problems. And at the same time, the European Union has only resettled, that is voluntarily taking in, taken in approximately 15,000 refugees from Syria, then we see that we can do much, much more. And that's maybe the last point I'm going to make. The 25th of May will also decide on whether we will have a transatlantic free trade agreement that will lower our standards, for instance, when it comes to consumer protection. So whether we will get more genetically modified organisms on our markets and hormone beef on our plates, or whether we will be able to stop that. The transatlantic trade deal also foresees a possibility for investors to sue governments or the EU as a whole if um, they think that policy decisions are not made in their regard. Just to give one example, the Swedish energy company Vattenfall is currently suing the German government because the German parliament has decided with the huge majority to phase out nuclear power. But Vattenfall was running um, nuclear power plants and they said, well, we don't like this phasing out. So they were suing the German government for, um, and, and not in a local court, not in a national German court, as, as German companies have also been doing, but because it's a foreign investor, it can sue the government in front of the international arbitration court, which is very intransparent and follows no rules that we would be used to from a normal like law system. And if Wattenfall wins, then Germany has to pay 3.7 billion euros. So that's the taxpayers who have to pay for that. And just to give you an idea, that's more than half of what the European Union is investing into the youth guarantee that is supposed to provide unemployed young people with a job. So this is the sort of amounts we're talking about and this sort of rights for investors, privileges to investors, we should definitely not give. Um, and, uh, but unfortunately, we and the, the left party are the only group in the European Parliament that is opposed to this trade deal. And uh, the others are, broadly speaking, like, are in a broad manner supporting it. So all of those things will be decided on the 25th of May and many more things that I now won't have time to mention. So it's really, really important that uh, we take up the opportunity to decide in which direction Europe will develop and that we all think well about who's representing our interests best. Thank you very much.